Miller Museum interviewing veterans, and today we have with us, what's your name, please? Leo Mahar. Where do you live, Leo? I live on 7th Griffin Avenue, Hoosick Falls. I see. Did you live in Hoosick Falls uh, all your life, or did you move in? No, I lived here, was born here in Hoosick Falls, in 1928. In 1928 you were born, all right. Where, tell us a little about before you went into the service, Leo. What'd you do? Well, I <coughs> graduated from high school here, and uh, did you go to the public school or St. Mary's? Public. I see. When went eighth grade to St. Mary's, and then went to public school. I see. And I graduated. All right. When'd you graduate? You know. Uh, Forty-eight. Forty-eight. All right. And then what did you do when you got out of uh, when you got out of high school? Well, I worked in the woods some, uh, logging, and did a little bulldozing and so forth. Uh, I got called in the uh, service in uh, October 49 <coughs> and uh, was in a year. You were drafted? Drafted for a year. I see. Got out in... Uh, well, what did you do that year you were in? What, what well, did they... We went uh, we sent to Japan and uh, I was in the 25th Infantry Division, the 27th Regiment. and. Uh, I got discharged uh, from there into the active reserve, and when the Korean War started, I was called back in and uh, shipped over. And well, you got called back in, it was when? Uh, October 50 you got called back in. October 50. I see, all right. The uh, war had started in August. That's right. August. Or July, I don't know, in that area. Around August, I think. Yeah. And then he, uh, I was shipped in to, uh, over to Korea, landed in Incheon. And Wait, before you you're jump, you were, you were already trained in the infantry. Yeah. So we they called, didn't give you any more training? Yes, we was called back. They sent us to Fort Hood, Texas for an uh, infantry refresher course. And then uh, sent to Camp Stoneman, California, where we shipped out for Korea. I was assigned to the 2nd Infantry Division. Yeah, when did you get Korea. to Korea about? In uh, November. In November of, of uh, 50. 50. All right. Uh, assigned to the 2nd Infantry Division <coughs> and uh, 9th Infantry Regiment, Company I. And uh, we were in Incheon, Seoul, and fought all through the mountains in Korea. Finally got up in and around Wanju, and uh, I was wounded uh, north of Wanju about March 1st, and uh, went into a Marine aid station. Now you were in a battle and you got wounded. Is that what happened? And you get it? Was it machine gun or no, I think shrapnel? Rifle. They were shooting at. We were trying to get up to this machine gun. Placement on the mountain, and uh, we got up. A squad of us got up fairly close to it, and we could see the Chinese every once in a while. And we creep, crawled up to where we thought we could throw some grenades into the uh, machine gun nest. One guy got a little too anxious, and he was too far away, and he threw the grenade. And of course, that alerted the Chinese. They started throwing grenades back. They had the old type German potato masher grenade that you pull the string on them to <coughs> activate the fuse. And when they threw the grenades, of course, it alerted these other Chinese on another ridge, uh, kind of guarding their flank. And uh, we could see the dirt flying up around us. So <coughs> when we got up, they jump back off the edge where they couldn't uh, Got a good shot at us. I jumped up and felt something hit me. It felt like a hammer, and it was <clears throat> like a, a sh electric shock, like it smashed your funny bone on something. And <clears throat> he hit me in the, the knuckles here. Of course, he had gloves on. And uh, he got down at the foot of the mountain to a medic, and he just wrapped it up. We couldn't get out because they had the road secure, the Chinese, we couldn't get out. The ones that were hit real bad, <coughs> they had a helicopter come in and take them out. 
but we didn't have helicopters like they had in Vietnam. We had a little small helicopter. They take two men in a basket on each side, <coughs> fly them out to an aid station. But they couldn't open a road to the other, you know, yeah. walking wounded. We had to wait till they secured the road so we could get out. And then our driver got lost, so <coughs> we got into a marine aid station. And they cleaned it, cleaned it up, and uh, put a cast on it. Didn't set any bones. And uh, from there, shipped to Tegu to an army hospital or field hospital. And from there, flew us back into uh, 140, 41st uh, General Hospital in uh, Japan, which they set a hand and kept, put a cast on. It. But then they had to cut that cast off because it was still swollen and it tightened up. So they had to cut that off and put another cast on it. And I stayed there until it healed up and uh, pretty good. And then they uh, assigned me to a second uh, medium port company in Japan where we were in uh, charge of the uh, unloading ships there in Tara Port. Japan had Japanese labor on all the ships and so forth. I see. <coughs> but I uh, lost my uh, company commander in one battle. He was he was a Second World War man, and uh, Captain Howe he got shot in the mouth. He was killed. Then my platoon leader, uh, Jerome McGovern, was killed in another battle we had, lost my squad, or er, my uh, squad leader, Robison, he was hit, mortar landed between uh, me and Robison. I heard the stuff go by me, he never touched me, but it hit him bad in the back, and I don't know whether he ever survived or not, they took him out. So, it was quite an experience, I'll tell you. Yeah, must have been terrible. And uh, you came back to Japan and you did that, and then uh, eventually, now let me ask you a couple questions. I've done some other veterans. They said it was cold as heck in Korea. Oh, it was cold. I hated winters ever since. But I used to sit in a hole at night. I usually had two men in a hole, and when they attacked, it was usually early in the morning, and you'd have two men in the hole, and <coughs> we'd take turns, you know, dozing. Uh, during the night, but then uh, about two or three o'clock, they'd wake everybody up. You'd be on full alert because that's usually when they they hit you. And uh, <coughs> boy, you'd, you'd look up uh, in the morning. You'd wake up and look at the guy in the hole next to you, and he looked like a porcupine with his whiskers all frost and yeah. the rifle all covered white with frost. <coughs> but. Uh, they said it was terribly cold. And well, we lost a lot of men with uh, frozen feet, yeah. frozen hands. I always kept a, an extra pair of socks, and I'd take my boots off at night, wring my wet socks out, and then put them down inside of my belt, and let the body heat dry them off and take the ones I had in my belt and put them back it. on. So. Uh, kept my feet from freezing that way, but they were plenty cold, I'll tell you. But yeah. I don't know how these guys from the south ever stood it, because, uh, you know, we were kind of used to being in the north, we're kind of used to cold weather, but that got down to 20 below zero over there, and you were sitting in a hole at night looking at the stars. And <clears throat> I used to look up at the moon when it was out and think, well, that's shining over Hooty Yeah. Okay, so there, that, another thing they told me, there were the trees, they cut all the trees down. And it was hard when you went up hills, there were no trees, it was just all little stumps. And yeah, stuff. they were usually like, uh, there was a lot of small scrub pine and, uh, and little scrub oak on a lot of the mountains. And uh, of course the artillery uh, knocked a lot of them, you know, yeah. uh, blew a lot of them off. But they, they had a great... Uh, trick of rolling grenades down at you. They, uh, they, the old ma banana masters didn't roll too good, but they had concussion grenades and they had fragmentation grenades of ours. 
and pineapples that they'd throw out <coughs> and let them roll. Then they'd roll right down the side of you. You wouldn't see them coming until they were right up next to you, you know, and then it was too late. <laughs> but uh, they were tough, I'll tell you, those Chinese. And they uh, lived on hardly any, nothing, you know, they didn't have the, the equipment we had. They had an awful lot of casualties from frozen feet because all they had were like little tennis shoes. I don't know how they, how they did it. How they did it but, uh, well, okay, so you're in Japan. Getting shipped home, right? And you came back, your hand healed pretty well, or? Yeah, well, it was crippled up for quite a while, but they straightened it out pretty good. And then, of course, using my hand, I think, with the work I was doing, helped yeah. loosen things up a lot. Yeah, I think it did, too. All right, so they shipped you back to the States. Yeah. And uh, you came back to the States uh, in uh, what? In, in, you got out in November of 51. 51. So you yeah. came back. And they discharged you. They discharged me from, we came back into the state of Washington when we came back. I went out of California twice. No, I went out of California the first time, came back into California. And the next time shipped out from California, and the last time come back into the state of Washington. I see. <coughs> then you got, you came back, did you get discharged out of no, Dix or some? Discharged from Kilmer. From Kilmer. All right, so then here you are, you're out of the service, finally, you got rid of that. Yeah. And you came back to Hoosick Falls, or? Yeah, came back to Hoosick Falls. And then what did you do, Leo? Well, I went in the excavating business then, and they stayed in that until I had to retire uh, with a heart problem, so. And you, you got married about when? I got married in about, around 54, 53 or 4. I see. And then uh, how many children did you have? I had six. Six children. Five girls and one boy. Yeah, that's terrific. Yep. And uh, that's about it, huh? Your kids are, some of them I, I know live around here. I see yeah. some of them. I know your son helps you. He was running that business now, right, that yep. you had. Right yeah. And I uh, <clears throat> see you've got one daughter in Philadelphia. Yeah, another one in Maine, one in East Greenbush, one here in Hoosick Falls, one in Bennington. So, they're, they're at least, you can see them. And so Mike forth. is in Bennington. Well, is there anything else you'd like to say about either Hoosick Falls or about the service that you want on record, you know? Or? Well, I went to see my platoon leader and his father, his family in Washington. Uh, I. I saw in a paper where he had two sons killed in action. He had one in the first cab that uh, was awarded the Medal of Honor, and Jerome, my platoon leader, was awarded the Silver Star. And his father <coughs> was so upset about the Korean War that he refused to let Truman uh, award either one of his sons a medal. So I wrote to him when I was in Albany in the VA and he wrote back to me and said that <coughs> he couldn't get any information about Jerome. He knew where his other son was killed and knew all about that, but he didn't know too much about Jerome. So he asked me if I'd He'd appreciate it if I could give him more information about your own. So, uh, I went to Florida one year with a friend of mine, and on the way back we stopped and looked his father up and uh, explained to him, you know, what happened and about where it was where he was killed. And I remember that night when he was shot, he uh, we were trying to take this hill out one day, he couldn't make it. Had to pull back and tried it again. <coughs> Fought all day, and that night we were pretty near to the top. And I heard Jerome holler, "Come on, you guys! What are you waiting for?" And evidently he stood up and skylighted himself. <coughs> and I didn't see his body. I didn't want to see it, but I. <coughs> yeah. Well. Okay. That's. It was nice of you to go back and see his father. It was really nice. 
Well, Leo, thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it. Appreciate it.